introductions and then we'll get started. You've made your way to our material sciences and engineering presentation. So on our call today, we have Dr. Tongue, as well as one of our academic advisors within our SEMPTI school, Shabnam. And then I am a recruitment coordinator with Fulton. So I will be in the background helping moderate our Q&A and our chat this evening. But um, with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Tange for all of the fun, interesting information about material sciences. Well, thank you for the introduction, Nina. Can you guys hear me okay? Everything is good, perfect. So, I mean, Nina, you have done the introduction. Uh, my name is Seth, the first three letters. Uh, that's what people call me all the time. Uh, my name is Lon, double A's, double T's. People butcher it all the time, so I decided, you know what, three first letters, you can't, you can't really butcher no more. So no more excuses. So it is Seth, Seth Tonga here. Um, I'm the chair of the under, undergraduate program of material science and engineering. So my goal today is to tell you what this program is all about. I just want to tell you what I do as in like, what we do as material science scientists and engineers, what kind of fields we go into. Uh, do we like doing this field? Yes, we do. It is a lot of fun. So I wanna just go over these very quickly. I highly encourage you guys to come out of your shell. I totally get it because I'm introverted myself. I know it is hard to believe. It is. It takes a lot of effort to ask the question, but just ask away. Okay, just whatever question, it, there is no stupid question, there is no nothing, just ask it, uh, don't hesitate. With that, I'm gonna start uh, the presentation that I put together. That pretty much goes through from A to Z of the material science, I promise you not to bore you. I'm not gonna go into the extreme technical details, but if you guys have any technical questions, I would be more than happy to answer those. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Let's see if it works. Yes, it does. Perfect. So um, this is the material science and engineering department. So the name is a little bit unfortunate. It says materials. When we talk about materials, we do not talk about materials like pen and pencil and rubber and those kind of things. It is a little bit more advanced, more than that. So what do we do? What do these materials engineers, scientists do? So we design and develop and manufacture and test and redesign and redevelop and optimize materials for applications, daily applications. Some of the examples can be, for example, you want switchable glasses at your home. You have a glass that is silicon oxide that is amorphous. We put very thin coating of carbon on it and by passing a little bit of electric current by 0.1 volt, immediately we can switch it. This is an established technology actually. It is expensive, but we designed these. We come up with the idea, this would be material science and engineering. You have your Adidas sneakers and then you're just jumping around. It, it is beautiful, it is, uh, good on your ankles, it is good on your knees. Somebody had to design it. I'm not talking about how cool it looks, what the colors are, but I'm talking about the polymer base, the base that is right at the bottom of your shoe. Who designed it? Material scientists and engineers. We had to design the porosity of this polymer. We had to innovate the polymer. It is a polymer science. It is polymer material science and engineering. You have your loved ones, if they've broken their bones and if it is beyond repair like elderly people do, the worst idea you can have is to just put a cast on and just wait for many, many months to heal. It's not gonna happen. You need to have an implant. This implant must be biocompatible. It needs to last for many, many years so that you don't undergo many surgeries. The design of this metal has to come from somewhere. This is material science and engineering. That's what we do. It is not as simple as take any metal piece and just stick it through the uh, bone. It is not going to work. It needs to flex the same way our bones do flex actually. If they are not compatible with each other, you're gonna keep cracking your bone. This is another example. We love making materials for energy conversion. 
solar panels that you see, they're all innovations of material science and engineering. Sometimes we cannot design it. Sometimes we are not as innovative as nature would be. Then we get some clues from the nature. We look at insects, we look at leaves, we look at plants, and then we innovate from those because those designs took many, many years to come to where they are at now. So this would be called mimicry. Some people call it materials mimicry, biomimicry, and whatnot. This is one of the areas that we do work on. Another one is I have to move this around a little bit. Another one is actually materials for future. Sometimes I cannot just simply say, what do you guys need? You guys cannot say, this is what I need because you don't know what might be available. Sometimes we design materials for future. What that means is some of the applications that doesn't exist right now on earth, we plan for those materials now so that we can make, for example, supercomputers. When we are dealing with these supercomputers, com this is from IBM actually, this is from 2019 IBM supercomputer. That is million times faster than your, any of your computers. These computers do not take silicon. They take completely different materials and somebody has to design it. This is material science and engineering. Again. So moving forward, I wanted to pick one example, if the slide allows me. If you go to San Diego, to the beach, you will have beautiful sand. That would be mostly silicon dioxide. You take that silicon dioxide, you process it, which is material science, that would be silicon wafer. We built devices on top of these silicon wafers, except this silicon wafer, when it is high purity, means nothing. You need to do something with it. What we do as material scientists, we put foreign atoms in it. Instead of just having 100% silicon, we put phosphorus in it. We sometimes put arsenic in it. We put different elements. Only when we do put these elements in, then you can get electronic applications. Without this step that I have described right here, there is no, absolutely no electrical applications, no electronics. You cannot use silicon. A material scientist and engineer must design these. Otherwise, it is not possible. So in a sense, Intel cannot operate without material science and engineering. Intel is one of the heavy uh, hires of material scientists. And in material science, we have a famous saying that is materials are like people. It is the defects in them that tend to make them interesting. That is true. Unless you incorporate these defects, these elements, these atoms that doesn't belong to silicon, they don't become interesting. You cannot make applications. In the big picture, what we try to do is we look at the structure of the material. I'm talking about atomic structure. We look at processing. Can we make this? Because if we cannot make this, we shouldn't waste our time and it needs to be cheap. We look at the performance. Are they going to do a good job? Are they going to defeat everything else available in the universe? We look at properties. Do we want them to conduct electricity or insulate them? Do we want heat to dissipate or do we want heat to retain? What do we want to do with it? This would fall all within the material science. And within material science and engineering, what we do is we look at many different scales. It starts from here, micron, all the way to nanometers and even lower. But in reality, what I didn't put out in this slide is actually we deal with much larger sizes as well, like the porosity in Adidas sneakers. And here's one video that I wanted to show you very quickly. And this gives you an idea. This is a simple pen. It is pen because it is material science. We do not do pens. We do not do uh, you know, rubber erasers or whatnot. But this particular video will show you across the landscape how things actually change. And please pay attention to scale here. I want to stop right here. This part 
is really cool. This is silicon silicon dioxide. It's a micro ball that uh, it is micro ball or millimeter sized ball, ball pan. And right behind this ball pan, you have an ink compartment right here. Each time you try to write it, this thing rolls and you spill the ink. The part that you're looking at here is aluminum. It is aluminum alloy. It has a bunch of scratches because possibly this pan went through a lot. But this aluminum is designed, specifically designed. Otherwise, pans would last a couple days. Somebody had to engineer this. Let's look at it a little bit more. We are zooming in. This is called microstructure. This is inside your metal. Without this microstructure, you cannot quite work with the metals the way you like to work with them. It's kind of porosity you can imagine. And right here, slowly you're starting to see these beautiful ordered atoms. Look at the length scales. This would be atomic structure of aluminum. And if you zoom in more, you can slowly get to the atoms. You can slowly start seeing individual atoms. And in material science, quite literally, we deal with all these different length scales and we play with it and we love it. Each length scale has a purpose. The large length scales, millimeter sizes, has a purpose when you design that metal, you can use it for automotive industry. If you're all the way to the nanometer scales, when you're dealing with atoms, you're dealing with, for example, quantum computation. That's also materials. I want to go back to the slide one more time. So some more examples. Right here, you're looking at military grade water filters. It is microporous ceramic that is created by material scientists and engineers. With that kind of filter, you can create, you can make clean water from very, very dirty water. This is one particular application area. Any kind of quantum uh, information technologies, quantum optics, any kind of electronics that you use right here would be materials. At ASU, for example, we have designed some of these solar panels that went onto Mars rover that was also a materials program. We can make mirrors that are good for telescopes for um, astrophysics applications. Oftentimes, we work in this funny suits. It would make beautiful Halloween costume, I believe. And we work in fancy laboratories to make fabrication so that we can innovate materials. We care about the nature. We make materials that are biodegradable. You, if you want, if you have a humorous side like myself, you can make Tonka trucks. You have to design polymers and plastics that, doesn't, uh, that is not uh, hurting our children. It is not cancer, cancerogenic. And as I was describing in the previous slide, by playing with the porosity of the materials, you can design metals and metals alloys. And car automotive industry has, has went through a lot of changes in the last two decades, all because of the material science and engineering. It is much lighter now. During the accident, it's much more safer because the way we designed metals allow it to be that way. So here at ASU, we have many faculty members within the materials program, and these faculty members have excellent track record. They are national award winners from the President Trump to White House to National Academy of Sciences to, you imagine. So basically imagine Oscars, Emmys, we have it within the material science and engineering. The best part of the material science and engineering program is the in undergraduate, the faculty ratio is very, very good. That means you get one-on-one -on -one attention quite often. It is very boutique program. You get Ivy League quality, Stanford, 
Japan or other places like quality education. These are some of the other examples. Uh, we are looking at National Academy of Inventors, two of these. We are looking at myself here from the uh, White House Award from the President Trump, for example. Not only faculty, but also student chapters help you. And we have one specific chapter within the materials program called Materials Advantage. For example, in two weeks, Materials Advantage will be meeting outside. They will have a picnic event within safety uh, guidelines. And these students meet on a weekly basis. Uh, currently, because of COVID-19, it is every Friday via Zoom. For the first time in two weeks, they are going to be meeting in person. When we were meeting in person, many faculty members would join. We would give special presentations. Our students would follow. And students would have many projects. They would present their projects in front of a large audience. We are integrated with the University of Arizona. We have a sweet competition with them each year. We give our best projects from each institution and we look at which one is the best, selected by all the faculty members. So where do our graduates go? These are some of the examples that I picked. These are not the best examples or worst examples. These are standard examples. One uh, student, that used to be undergraduate student here, undergraduate class of 2019. He's currently at MIT. He's a PhD student at MIT. One of our undergraduate students, she graduated in 2018. She did one extra year to do master's work. And currently she's working at Applied Materials here in Phoenix. And this is her current salary. Here's another, um, here's another example right here. We have two PhDs, for example. They have taken their PhDs from uh, Arizona State University at Materials. One of them is working at Intel. The other one is currently professor at the University of California. When you graduate, typical salary is around 65,000. With five years, you reach to 81. This is national average. So we are a little bit much higher than this a little bit more higher than this within Phoenix area. Again, this is a national average. The reason why I picked material science in the big picture was I just wanted to make a difference in the world. I just didn't want to deal with, is it 5.51 or is it 5.52? Or that's not what I wanted to deal with. What I wanted to deal with, with was, is it one, is it 10? Is it million? Big questions. I wanted to solve many problems from ground up. I just wanted to be able to use the innovation to its maximum. I wanted to influence. I just wanted to be relevant. This is why I picked material science. I thought I would share my personal experience with you very briefly so that you, get, you guys can understand what prompted me to go to material science because I didn't wake up one day and I didn't say, you know what, I want to be a material scientist. That didn't work like that. So if you guys have any questions, I will be here. We don't have any questions in the Q&A just yet, but this is a really wonderful opportunity for any students that are interested in Fulton or specifically your materials program to ask questions. Um, we also have our academic advisor on the call too, so talking about some of the coursework or course requirements, we're open for those questions as well. So we'll stick around. Um, if you've gotten what you need from, your from our session, you're more than welcome to head on with your evening, but you're also welcome to stick around for some Q&A um, if you have questions as well. Okay, so we do have a question. Um, I would say probably a little bit for both Shabnam and Dr. Tongay. Um, so what kind of student uh, succeeds the most? So I guess we'll rephrase this as um, what makes a student successful in this program? Well, it depends on how we measure success. Uh, so if you're measuring success by making a lot of money, let's say, in that case, which is fine, uh, in that case, I would say um, good GPA and very, very disciplined work would help. Uh, that is important. And I would also say selecting uh, which field you want to work in is also equally important. But if you're measuring success as in like personal success, you are happy with your work. 
it is not a work that you say, oh my God, it is Monday again. I never said that, honest. I love this job. Um, if that is how you measure, you're making a living, you're making good money, and you're happy with your work, and you feel like you are relevant in the world, you have a place, then I would say to be successful, you need to be engaged. Engaged in research. You need to, starting from the second year, and that's why we try to encourage our students to be integrated in active research, most of our students, 80% of our students, I'm talking about undergraduate students, they are involved in active research by the end of their second year. So that gives them the, all the summer together with two more extra years to get hands-on experience. And when I say hands-on experience, I don't mean like, oh, I did a little bit touching here and then I touch this, this, that, and then I take a picture, I put it on Instagram and I had, I don't know, five second TikTok video that got 20,000 views. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about being really engaged and doing something and you go back home and you say, you know what, mom, I did this. How about that? You know, that's education for you right there. So what I'm trying to say is answer is be engaged. Engaged with other students, be engaged with us, faculty members, be engaged in active research. Just come out of your shell because we are happy to help here. I hope this answers the question. I'm not sure. No, I think that's perfect. Shravnan, do you have any um, advice for student success? Yes. Uh, so, uh, I mean, Dr. Tanga get, kind of put it in a gist, be engaged, make sure you ask for help when you need help. Uh, you know, you when you come to ASU, it's your education. So uh, make sure you reach out because yes, we would try to reach out to you. However, uh, we cannot get to every student all the time. So please be sure to, again, uh, talk to your professor. They may be intimidating. They're not, they're people. They will understand you. Uh, come to us, advisors that are here, your first point of contact. So when you get to ASU, we are your first point of contact. So anytime you feel like you're lost, stop by. I mean, as of right now, you can't really stop by, but you can email us. You can schedule an appointment with us and we're more than happy to help. Just be engaged in everything you do. College, college work is just not about going to class. It's more than that. It's Dr. Tanga said, doing research, doing internship, just uh, socializing also very, very important, especially nowadays. It's very important that you socialize that will keep you, you know, sane and motivated to continue, um, you know, doing your best. I want to give one more example, actually, very quickly. It happened last week, actually. One of our first year students reached out to me. She is online. She's not online student. She is joining currently because of COVID-19. She is online student. Her family is from Philadelphia. She lives in Philadelphia currently. She sent me an email and she to ask me how I feel about her coming to Tempe for the spring semester. And her family wanted to look for houses here for renting. And I was like, well, if you like to come and if you like to experience and get to know around and this, this, that, where I'm trying to get this. This student reached out, and let me tell you what happened. The discussion evolved very quickly. Two days later, this student, her mom, and her father jumped on the plane, came directly to Tempe, met with me in person. I have given them a lab tour, which they loved. I have introduced one or two realtors. So what I'm trying to say is we are engaged. We are a relatively small program. We are a boutique program. We do care about each one of our students very, very much. So as long as you tell us what is going on, as long as you tell us how, what kind of help you need, Shabnam is great, Jeffrey is great, Nina is great, we all are going to help you. So we have a couple other questions that have been coming in. So um, kind of speaking to the, the boutiqueness of the program, about how many students would you say are in material sciences? So um, within our program, um, I would say 50 students would be reasonable per, per, per year. So that would add up to roughly 200 students in the entire program. 
and we have 20 uh, faculty members. So that is one to 10, give or take, if we don't account for adjunct faculty. When we put the adjunct faculty, as I described, it is one to eight ratio. And it is very select um, and it is very unique. And for that reason, finding job is fairly easy because across the nation, material science programs are always selective. They always keep their student body. For example, MIT accepts 10 or 15 students. Stanford accepts 20 students or so. That's the range. The largest program that I've seen was University of Florida that was 75 students. But if you look at the job posts, it always says material science and engineers and mechanical engineers. They always go hand to hand. So for that reason, our graduates uh, graduate and they just get their offer letters before they graduate. All right, so we have a couple other questions. Um, so speaking about being engaged, can you speak a little bit about the research opportunities that undergraduates have within material science? Absolutely. So the research areas are very broad. Um, first, I wanna tell you a couple uh, research areas so you guys have an idea about what kind of things we do here at ASU Materials Program. Batteries, advanced batteries, flexible batteries, water splitting to generate hydrogen for energy conversion, solar cell research, that's what we do. Carbon capture, carbon emission studies, we do that. We do quantum materials, which means complete the new quantum application, supercomputers and whatnot, we do that. Um, I'm thinking about metal alloying, meaning new metal alloy design so that we can create much better newer construction materials for cars, for construction sites or whatnot, we do that. Um, what else I'm thinking about it? We do fundamental research such as materials chemistry and materials physics. We try to understand material properties in full depth. We do high, high electron mobility transistors, new generation of field effect transistors. It would be materials electronics. We do that. I'm thinking like a lot. Yes, we look at, for example, one of our faculty member, Cody Friesen, works on um, taking creating water out of nothing. He uses solar cells, solar panels, to create electricity, passes that electricity from the materials that he created, that's the innovation. When you pass that current from that material, in that material, that material cools off quite a bit. And what happens is it captures the humidity in air and it makes water out of it. So he goes in the middle of the desert, he creates water out of nothing. And when I talk about water, I'm talking about like drinkable water. It's not like junk. So within those research areas, typically, as I mentioned, by the end of your second year, uh, you're going to be finding one of these research groups. But to answer your question directly, one program that we have is FURY, which is Fulton Undergraduate uh, Research Initiative. Within that program, this program gives you some stipends and some budget for you to carry out your research direction that you want to take. Either you come up with your own research or you discuss your research with other faculty members and you design it, you apply for it. Our materials students always get it to be perfectly honest and we are good. Um, and then within that program, you start your research. That's one of them. The second one is you email. Oftentimes this is what happens at least with my group. They email, they say, hey Seth, I think you're awesome. We took your class. It was super cool. We want to come and work with you. And typically, they start working. And oftentimes, some of them may say, mm, I'm not interested anymore. They can find a completely different research group. That'd be the second one. Also, we have uh, our EU experiences, which is a uh, summer research series that is done through NSF. Within that NSF program, you go to different places or you stay here. We have government funds. These government funds give you stipend or per hour based uh, opportunities while you do re your research, you get paid, for example. Uh, we sent our students to Germany, to Ireland, to other countries. Singapore is one of them. Many of them stayed here to do research. So it, we have a lot going on. Coordinated efforts, it's not chaos. All right, looks like we have one question that's a little more on the personal side of things. So what kind of student were you like? What would you have done differently in school? 
when I was a student, I will be very honest. Um, my parents, uh, how should I say? I, I don't want to use strong words, but I pretty much hated my parents because they moved a little bit too much. I never could stay at any given place to make good friends, like, you know, good friends. And the worst of it was the following. They kept moving from one country to another country to another country that spoke all different languages. As such, I had very little to talk with people. I told you guys when I'm introverted, I mean that. So um, I didn't have the common language. The only thing that I was good at was mathematics, which is the common language we all speak. So mathematics, I was very good at it. The rest, I was horrible. If you go to my primary school uh, friends, secondary school friends, high school friends, they would say I was at the bottom, like just nothing. But in my free time, I was always curious. I always was interested in science and engineering. I would design houses. I would make little cars. Um, and when I say little cars, I, it's not stupid cars. I would just really go into the details of it. I would make, I would play with baking soda and this, this, that. I knew chemistry and materials was my passion. And I went from there. So to answer your question, with all honesty, mathematics, I was good. With chess, people thought that I would be a chess player, not international ch chess player. Uh, but I ended up being material scientist. I think I'd call that a win. I'm sure, do you play chess? <laughs> I still do. I still do play chess, uh, but I don't do for money or for career that I don't do. All I right. enjoy watching more than playing. Okay, so this um, I would say to go, would go to both Dr. Tange and Shabnam. So do you need a lot of chemistry and mathematics for material science and engineering? So can we speak a little bit about the specific course load as far as chemistry and math goes? I will let Shab now handle this, uh, but I'm just gonna say something very quickly. Answers, yes. You will need a little bit of mathematics, a little bit of chemistry, and um, and we will teach you. Shab now. Yeah, so um, as you guys, guys can see here, this is our uh, flow chart, our major map. It just outlines courses that you have to take within the four years to graduate with the material science and engineering um, bachelor's degree. Uh, so yes, you will have to do some science and some math. And of course those science and math will be implemented in your in material science classes. Um, the math sequence you follow would be calculus one, two, and three. This is a very uh, common for all engineering majors at ASU. We have Calc 1 through 3 required for all majors. Uh, you do have uh, physics 1 and physics 2. And then also some, of course, some chemistry there. Uh, but yeah, generally you will do some of those introduction, you know, introductory science classes, math classes. Uh, it uh, dives then into like linear algebra and uh, differential equations. You may not be familiar with those just yet if you're in like 10th grade or 11th grade. But yeah, the, so the curriculum is here. The first year is pretty much very general uh, general studies classes, such as, you know, calculus one and two, physics one, chemistry one, English composition. Uh, in the second semester, you do take a, your first material science class. So hopefully by then you'll have a good idea what material science is and whether that would be the you know right major for you. But um, yes, so some of these classes can be taken in high school while you're you know doing dual enrollment or even AP. So if you're taking AP calculus, AB, and you get a score of four or three or four, that gives you uh, you know credits for our calculus one class. Uh, if you get, if you have, you're taking AP Calculus BC, that can give you credits for these two classes, so Calculus 1 and 2, of course, if you have the appropriate score. Um, AP Physics, unfortunately, doesn't count for anything, so if you're taking AP Physics, very good for your, you know, knowledge, for your background, you're going to do great in our physics classes, however, those do not give you uh, credits towards our physics because our physics is university physics and it's calculus based, whereas the physics you may be taken through AP is um, not calculus based. And of course, the same applies to chemistry. If you're taking chemistry and you have appropriate score, that may give you credit for this chemistry right here. 
So just based, you know, on what you complete in high school through the enrollment in AP, you might be advanced in the major, but also just want to mention for material science, we do have the four plus one program. Basically, what 4 plus 1 program is that you finish your bachelor's degree in four years, and then the plus 1 portion is your graduate degree, your master's degree, and you finish basically your master's degree within one year, because some of the classes that you're going to be taking towards the master's degree, you're going to be completing them while you are an undergraduate student. So that saves you a whole semester and a whole semester to pay for. So that does the pros of 4 plus 1 is it's easier to get in than our um, you know, traditional master's degree because it's not selective. As long as you meet the requirements, the requirements at 3.5 GPA in all courses, uh, uh, first year through third year. So your freshman, sophomore, and junior year, and then you have three professors who would recommend you. So if you're in the material science program, as Dr. Tange said, everybody knows each other. So you're probably going to have a lot of professors who would be more willing to recommend you for the program. Um, yes, so and yeah, so it depends. We also have a three plus one program. If you if you completed the first year in high school, like doing dual enrollment credits or AP credits, you can be in our three plus one program, which means you graduate with your bachelor's degree in three years, and then um, the one year is going to be your master's degree. So getting two degrees within four years is great. Anything that you want to add to Dr. Tange? Um, no, I want to just mention this four plus one program is a smoking deal. Uh, what, what it means is basically all of a sudden you're not bachelors uh, of materials, but you are masters of materials. You may say, well, master versus bachelor, what, does, what difference does it make? If you go back to my presentation, you will see the difference. When you have a master's degree, um, you will immediately jump your salary to easy uh, 100,000. So that's a six digits for you. So that you're not going to be able to get to that digits straight out of your bachelor's. You will, of course, but just it's going to take a bit longer. So I highly recommend to our students that they do four plus, uh, four plus one degree, which is fun, honestly. It is, they, they, they all love it. Research plus classes, it is amazing year, honestly. That plus one is amazing. The rest, I all agree. <laughs> and I want to mention year one. It is This is standard, isn't it, Shabna? Meaning uh, across the engineering, it is not specific to us. And this is something that we have to do to be uh, to recognize this materials program degree across the nation. You have to take these electives and uh, fundamentals. Absolutely, yes. If you look at any uh, degree through Fulton Schools of Engineering or any other programs in other universities, they do have it's these classes, yes. Exactly. Any other questions? So in case um, any of you are hesitating, we got Casey, Chloe, Jaden, Jennifer, and Nathan. Um, I wish I could see you. I can't, but I hope you can see me fine. Um, if you have questions, please do ask away. Don't hesitate. Uh, and again, I genuinely love this, uh, love this particular program. I was a chemist. I was a physicist. I did a lot of electronics, and here I am. I love it. If you have questions, just feel free to ask me those questions. Nina is here, Shapna is here. Um, Nina, do they have our contact information, email information? Um, I can certainly put it in the chat. I don't think we shared it just yet, but I'll put my direct email in and then Shapna, if you want to do yours as well. Um, yes, please. And I hope that we meet. Um, I hope that we will get to meet each other and I hope that you guys will join us and I will be happy and I want to mention I know all of our students by their name. I do not forget them. Um, they are my friends on uh, Instagram, Facebook, all of those. We always talk to each other. It's really close community. It's just beautiful. I love it. Well, thank you so much for taking the time out of your evening, everyone, to join us. So we'll stick around for 
a few more questions or a few more minutes if there are any questions. But if you are on your way out for the evening, thank you for taking the time to, to learn a little bit more about Fulton and our material science program. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you everyone for joining. I'm waiting for that one more question. <laughs> I think we have a question. We do. All right. What has been the most memorable part of being in material science and engineering? Put you on the spot. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, most memorable. I would say, um, yeah, most memorable to me is nothing political. Um, most memorable to me has been um, when I received the award from President Trump. Um, he, he awarded me with this, um, with this key case award that comes from the White House. Uh, that was the highest recognition. And basically White House recognized all the, all the quantum materials that I design, all the quantum emitters that I make is used in Army and Navy and Air Force. And they want to acknowledge that. I think that that was most memorable to me. That was last summer. I was really, really happy. Super happy. Super happy. Like I was jumping like a little kid. <laughs> Literally, I was jumping. Like I was like, I couldn't believe it. That was awesome. I loved it. You said that was last year? That was last year, 2019 summer. Wow, gosh. 2019 summer, yeah, it was it was great, honestly. So if I don't know anybody is interested in, let me write down my that first of all, let me write down my email before I forget. And I'm gonna also give my um, Instagram that is right there. <laughs> Um, it is most social professor because I'm the least social professor. So that joke is on me there. <clears throat> so I, some of the pictures are there. That's why I just gave my Instagram. Do we have other questions? Chloe, Jennifer? No more. Well, you have my contact information. Feel free to reach out. All right. Thank you, you know, Shabnam. Uh, this is a lot of work, I know. Hey, I truly appreciate your hard work here. I mean that. Absolutely, it's what we like to do. <laughs> this, is, this is really, really good stuff. I'm, I'm, I'm glad that I'm working with you guys. Thank you, we love it too. All right, I'm going to leave now if it is okay to leave. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So the one more question. I see one more. Oh, one more. We got one more. Oh, thank no you. More. I learned no. a lot. You're very <laughs> thank welcome. Thank you, Jennifer. I'm glad you enjoyed it. All right, reach out if you have any questions, but we're gonna close the room now and I hope everyone has a wonderful evening. Thank you, you too. Bye, everyone. Thank you.